Hi, good morning, everyone. So glad you're all here today. I'm, my name is Danny, and I'm filling in for Jake. And while he's away in Hawaii, oh, yes, he can have a seat. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's in Hawaii. He's probably, you know, sipping on some pina coladas and catching some waves. And probably both at the same time, you know. He's pretty good at multitasking. <laughs> but, so I want to start off by sharing a story of my late friend, DC. And he was the one who helped lead me to God. But he was so much more than just a friend. He was a mentor, a father figure, and someone that I could lean on. And I always knew that I could go to him. And he didn't have very many things, but he was a man of faith. And he helped teach me about the Bible. And he helped lead others to Christ, like my wife Christina, some of my friends. And he always gave the glory to God. And he was humble, and he called himself God's nobody. And I share this because he was an example of someone who submitted himself to serving the Lord. And his hope was not in the things of the world, but to an eternal God that offers a living hope. And he contributed to God's kingdom by leading us to Christ. And I might not even be up here right now if it wasn't for him. So I thank God for putting him in my life. He wasn't perfect, but he pointed me to the God who is. So my encouragement to you today is to give all of yourselves to God who offers an eternal hope and not in the things of this world that surely fade. And we'll be diving deeper into this topic in this week's scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 through 21. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that you use me as your servant to deliver this message for you, to give all the honor and glory to you. May you open our hearts and minds to receive a word and a blessing you would have us for today. We thank you and give you all the praise and glory for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, Verse 17 says, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. So Peter gives us an instruction here to pass the time of our sojourning in the fear of the Lord, because he is our judge, and he will judge us according to our words. So the things that we do with the time that we have here matters. Knowing this, we should make the most out of our time that we've been given on this earth by living in the fear of the Lord, which is submitting to his will, Submitting all of yourselves to him. That's what that is. It's humbling ourselves. Allowing your hearts to be softened and willing to be used by God. And that word sojourning here means stranger or foreign. Because we are strangers in this world. Because we are not of this world. We have to remember that we are God's creation. Made in his image. We are his masterpiece. And he has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. Think of it like this. Think of our lives as a story. And when we submit ourselves to God, we allow God to write his story through us and our lives. He is our perfect author. And we know this because he's the creator of our universe. He's our redeemer who defeated sin and death. And he's given us a living hope through Jesus. And he's restored our relationship to him. On the contrary, we are not very good authors at all. When we try to write our own story, we bring sin into this world by disobeying him. And in our rebellion, we see the brokenness of the world that we see today. So we have to understand that there is a calling on our lives to live for God and to participate in his mission. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In this verse, Paul is pleading that we live for God. There's a sense of urgency and importance. And this relates to what Peter tells us in verse 17 on how we should spend our time. So offering our bodies as a living sacrifice pertains to every aspect of our being. 
including our thoughts and our words, our actions and our heart. And this plea comes from what God has already done for us through his, by his mercy. And this truth should empower us to live for God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, it says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we have to take the time to assess our words and actions and think, will this honor God or is this honoring ourselves? Ultimately, we do have a choice to follow God. But in, and inevitably we will make mistakes, but by the grace of God, his calling remains. So by his mercy, we can get back up and continue living for him. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul warns us that our minds and hearts should not be set on the things of the world, which is full of brokenness, false promises, but be transformed. Our lives that we live should be with a transformed mind that can only be received through our faith in Jesus. And by doing so, we can experience the goodness of God in our own lives, and that we can show to others as well. But if we follow the way of the world, that will just lead to more brokenness. In 1 Peter, verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with the corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So Peter is trying to tell us that no amount of money or fame or material possessions can save us. And the harder that we try to work, the more it leaves us wanting more. Because the things of this world fades, it corrupts, and it's only temporary. And vain conversations here refers to our lifestyle, our behaviors, our mindsets, and our selfish desires. These which were handed down by our ancestors, but essentially others living for the world. At the time Peter was writing this, there were two main groups of people. One of those were those following the false religions, like the Pharisees, with their man-made traditions and idols. And the other group were, the, were those who were following their own selfish ambitions, seeking the pleasures of the world and living lifestyles of ungodliness. We see the same pattern in the world today. These ideas that are so prominent, like putting your trust in wealth, material items, and accomplishments, and other idols, there's so many different paths that are told, that we are told lead to happiness and fulfillment, but they only leave our hearts empty. And I want to expand on one of these ideas, that consumerism has such a stronghold in today's modern American society. We are told to chase the next big thing, like the newest iPhone, or the luxury cars, and designer clothes, because we often equate our success and self-worth with the things that we own. We see this influence on social media and TV and magazines and only perpetuate these ideas of materialism. So people work so hard, sometimes their whole lives striving to obtain these things because we are trying to find value in the things that we own. So it's not just about getting that fancy pair of jeans or a nice jacket to show off. It's hoping that others will love you and accept you. But even after getting that thing, that special thing, it might not measure up to how we thought it would have made us feel, or we may not have gotten the approval or acceptance from others that we had hoped for. So one way we try to remedy that disappointment is by buying even more. Mm -hmm. But this happiness is only temporary because before we know it, the next new thing comes out, enticing us again and again and again. 
because you're only cool if you have that new thing. But what about those who seem to have it all? Sometimes the very people that just seem to have everything, like fame, money, the cars, are the ones who are especially hurting deep down. And it's not uncommon to see celebrities struggle with addictions to drugs and alcohol and mental health issues. But how can this be? Shouldn't they be the happiest people on the earth? This should be a lesson to us and should tell us that even though you have everything that you think that you need and want, it does not solve all the problems in our lives. The snare of consumerism is a dangerous loop that leaves us chasing after a life that never fully satisfies. And the next path I want to expand on is our careers. So, you know, one of the hardest things I have to go through as a husband is watching Hallmark movies with my wife. <laughs> and I end up watching a few. She loves them so much. And, um, they are so good. <laughs> So, as I'm watching these movies, there's usually a story element of the main character, usually the main character who is overworking themselves or so committed to their work. Uh, maybe they're trying to get a promotion or a raise, and they end up working so hard they burn themselves out. And they start to forget who they are and what's important in life. And as the movie goes on, we see this character go on this journey of reflection and self-discovery, and by the end of the movie, they realize that there's more important things to life than just their careers, like spending time with loved ones, and or that same guy who seems to be in all these Hallmark movies. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to share that I've also experienced this type of burnout myself. I've been working at UCSF for almost five years now, and during that time, I pushed myself especially when I first started out. I had this sense of placing my value on the work that I was doing and how well I performed because I was seeking to be acknowledged, recognized, and valued. I tried to justify my efforts by telling myself that I was working as unto the Lord, but I later realized that my efforts were coming more from my insecurity. If we are motivated by seeking the approval of others, there's a high chance that we'll experience this burnout too. I put such high expectations on myself that I ended up focusing too much on the things that I wasn't able to do rather than the things that I was doing every day. And if I didn't meet my own expectations that I put on myself, I, I put myself down. And I felt that I wasn't working hard enough. I just felt like I wasn't enough. So I had to learn to start letting this go, this mindset that was unhealthy, and I had to understand that the work will always be there, mm -hmm. and that my value does not come from my accomplishments or from the approval of others. Now God does say to work as unto the Lord, so I always try my best to do that every day, but I have to remember to give myself grace, and, and that effort and that work should not be placed above God nor at the expense of myself or those around us. I'm not saying it's bad to, to have a high paying job or to seek a promotion, but we just have to recognize that our self-worth is not found in how big our paycheck is or what position that we hold. When we fully commit ourselves to our careers, we can lose sight of what really matters. <clears throat> to seek first his kingdom and these things will be added unto you. And this career focused mentality affects our day-to-day -day lives. And we put such a high value on careers that one of the most common things that we say to someone when we first meet them is, what do you do for work? Mm -hmm. And that's and that's fine. It's, there's nothing wrong with getting to know someone for what they do. But asking this, oftentimes, we put too much focus on their identity and value. And we shouldn't think of others in this way. There is so much more to us than the work that we do. But the world loves to put people in boxes that define us. If we are not careful, we too can fall into this mindset that our job is all that there is in life. 
So I want to also share that I've recently been experiencing this, this burnout and been praying about this more this past year. And I've noticed that God has really been helping me to have this weight off my heart, my shoulders. And I just appreciate those who have helped support me with that, my wife and some others in the church that helped pray for me on that. So just understanding that God is where we can find peace and restoration. So I ask God to help me persevere and give me the strength when things get tough. And speaking of elevating things above God, this would be considered idol worship. Sometimes we think of idol worship as just bowing before statues or, or images, but which it is, but it's not just that. It's when our heart is focused on anything other than God and is elevated above Him. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And this can range from prioritizing our personal comfort to the relationships that we have, like loving a family member or a significant other more. I want to give an example. Say I had a friend who was Christian and he was dating this girl and he was thinking of marrying her. But one day she comes up to him and says that she doesn't believe in God anymore. And so if he were to stay with her and they end up getting married, then he would be elevating her above God as an idol because he's putting her first above what God says, which is to not be unusually loved. Another example is too much screen time or TV uh, playing on our phones. I mean, some screen time is not bad, but if we find ourselves spending countless hours and all of our free time going to that, we have to think to ourselves, are we turning this into an idol? We see a warning from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9, verse 13 and 14. And the Lord answered, it is because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, that they have not walked in it or obeyed my voice. Instead, they have followed the stubbornness of their hearts and gone off after the vows as their fathers taught them. So don't let stubbornness and pride get in the way of following God. If we harden our hearts toward God, we end up trying to find meaning in, and purpose in life outside of God. And it's important to note here that Jeremiah is speaking to the Israelites and the people of Judah who were eventually exiled at the hands of Babylon. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and money. So this verse here is describing money as an idol in this context, but the principle still applies that we cannot have two masters. We have to ask ourselves, are we putting our faith in the things of this world? <coughs> we have to learn from the mistakes that our ancestors did, who disobeyed God and who chose to worship the things of the world. King Solomon, in his pursuit for life, for the meaning of life, he has experienced all of what the world has to offer, from the pleasures of the world, wealth, wisdom, and achievements. But he may have said it best. Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. He came to the conclusion that everything is meaningless apart from God, and he speaks on how we are to live out our lives. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, along with every hidden thing, whether good or evil. This echoes what Peter says, and how our lives should be focused on God, and the eternal things in the world that do not do. So we have to remember that nothing in this world can fill that void in our hearts or redeem us. But God can. He offers a living hope that not only saves us from condemnation, but from a life of striving for meaningless things. And in 1 Peter chapter 19, uh, verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, 
as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So nothing we do can live up to God's standard because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the only way that our relationship can be restored with God is by someone taking the punishment for sin. And this was paid for by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross by giving up his life. So we are now redeemed because of the sinless nature, as the verse says, as of a lamb without spot. Jesus' blood is so precious, but God was willing to sacrifice his only begotten son for us. So we have to understand that in God's eyes, we are worth so much because he was willing to pay such a high price for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We have to remember, God is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of all things, including our bodies and our souls which was paid for through Jesus. Because we're redeemed, we have this calling in our lives now, to live in service to Him, to honor Him with every fiber of our being and to the deepest part of our soul, because that's where God wants to be. <clears throat> By walking in this godly way of living, we are actively turning from sin that defiles our body and spirit, because our bodies are a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell and to be used for his purpose. And we are called to keep it holy. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, He did not enter by the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, once for all, by his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. In the Old Testament times, they had to make animal sacrifices as a temporary covering of sin. But Jesus' sacrifice is eternal, it's complete, and never again needed to be repeated. This means that our eternal fates require an eternal solution. Jesus is that solution. <coughs> In verse 20 it says, Who verily was foreordained by the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. God's wisdom is immeasurable. He always had a plan to bring us back to him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just made up when sin entered the world. God knew even before the foundation of the world, the sacrifice that Jesus would have to make. And it's true that our sins separate us from God. But God has revealed his plan to us to defeat sin and the devil and to restore relationship with him even right after the first sin was made in Genesis. Chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And he further revealed by foretelling the Messiah, by speaking through the prophets of the Old Testament. So when Jesus arrived, we would know what that means for the entire world. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, and this is referring to Jesus. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was written in the scriptures, in all the scriptures about himself. So Jesus himself spoke to his disciples and showed him where to look in the scriptures that was written about him. And the prophets of the Old Testament didn't know all the details when they were prophesying about the Messiah. They only knew certain things. It even took a while for the disciples to understand, even after Jesus showed them where in the scripture, where it says. And it wasn't really until after Jesus was resurrected until they understood who he was. But we are so fortunate to live in a time that we have such a sure word of prophecy the complete word of God revealed to us. Mm -hmm. And in these last times, this refers to the period of Jesus' ascension after the crucifixion until his return. And that's the time period we're living in right now. 
we read in 2 Peter verse uh, chapter 1, verse 3, According as to his divine power have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. So we have everything that we need in the word. All the questions that we have in this life and godliness right in our hands. Think of it like this. Living in the Old Testament times is like trying to build a Lego with only some of the instruction pages. But living in today's time, we have all of the pages needed to build our life. So we have to understand the manual and instructions to life is the Word of God, the complete Word of God. And our last verse in 1 Peter verse 21 who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith might be in God. God is faithful, and he always keeps his promises. Mm -hmm. Out of his love, he sent Jesus to fulfill his promises and to be our living hope. We know that our hope is in the right place when we put our faith in Jesus and his resurrection and not in the things mm -hmm. of the world can live knowing that Jesus conquered the world through his resurrection. So we no longer have to live in this world that only ensnares us, steals our identity, and give us a false hope. Understand that because he lives in us, we too can also overcome the world. So the last thing is this. Why live for the lesser things? when we have an opportunity right in front of us to take part in God's mission and to bring people to Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So when we submit ourselves to loving God and allowing ourselves to be led by the Spirit, God's purpose is lived out through us. And we too can have an eternal effect on those around us, like my friend DC had an impact on me. And DC didn't have very much, but he lived faithfully for Jesus. And this taught me that you do not have to have much in this world to have an effect for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. So live your life loving God loving others, and show the world that our hope is not in the fading treasures of this life, but to a living Savior. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we do not have to walk in this world blind. We can walk in this world following you, following your word, you provided us a hope and salvation through Jesus. And you've reconciled our relationship to you because you love us so much. You knew us. You knew who we would be even before the foundation of the world, before we were founded in our mother's womb. God, your love, we cannot comprehend. So I ask, Lord, that you reveal more and more of you in our lives. For those of us who do not know you, Lord, we ask God that today be the day of salvation. We give you all the honor, all the work that you've done, and it's a free gift for us that you've given. The salvation is not by works, but it is by grace and faith we are saved. We thank you for completing the work, for keeping your promises, for loving us, unconditionally. And God, for those of us that do know you, we pray that you encourage us to live more and more for you, that it can be less of us, but more of you revealed and glorified. All the honor and glory to you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Next, we'll have a video uh, that we'll put on the screen. Thank <laughs> you.